What we need what is not need more medication, more medication but more education, more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Expose coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm your regular host, Tony Akia. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more medication, more medication but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Expose with Tony Akinyami. We started our conversation on your water and your health. And today we're going to continue with water pollutants and contaminants. Last week we looked at two of them and today I'll be picking up from the third. This is very important so that at least we are aware and well informed about the things that can be found in the water that we drink and use for, you know, our culinary arts, the water we use in cooking, the food that we eat. All right, now water pollutants and contaminants can cause diseases if we don't understand them and we don't know how to remove them from the water that we use for food and for drinking. And so today we'll be looking at contaminant number three, and that is inorganic minerals in water. Now, water that has not been purified contains a number of substances. It's not just H2O. Water is supposed to be simply H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen in a molecule. Water, H2O. But apart from the H2O, we always find other things dissolved in water, whether it is well water or borehole water or even rainwater, rivers, streams, lakes, whatever the source of the water. Some other things find their way into the water. So water that has not been purified contains a number of those substances, particularly inorganic minerals. Now, inorganic minerals just constitute one category of the many things that can be found in water. We'll be talking about quite a number of them. Okay, a simple test, if you want to know whether your water contains anything apart from H2O, is to put a drop of water on a very clean, transparent glass and let that water dry up. Just a drop of water on a clean, transparent glass. And let it dry up. You will notice a film remaining on the glass, something like a small patch where the water dried up. That film, that patch you're seeing on that glass is the inorganic solids in the drop of water that you put on that glass. Once the H2O evaporates, it leaves the dissolved uh, inorganic minerals in the water behind. Now, inorganic minerals that are commonly found in water may include uh, calcium in particular, yeah. Sometimes toxic metals like mercury, lead, and things like aluminum, tin, cadmium, zinc, cobalt, Maybe selenium, sometimes even uranium, molybdenum, nickel, silver, arsenic, chrome, boron, sulfur, barium, lithium, silicon, and the list is endless. Now, the human body actually needs some of these minerals I have mentioned. Maybe things like calcium, like selenium, okay, like boron, like sulfur. You know, all of these are wonderful minerals and trace minerals that the body needs to function optimally for various biochemical processes in the body. However, some of these minerals and trace minerals in water are found in their inorganic state. Now, organic minerals are obtainable essentially from our food, especially from raw vegetables, nuts, and fresh fruits. So what God has done is the plant will grow its root into the soil. 
and use his root system to suck up these minerals, inorganic minerals, and then chelate them by adding some amino acids and a few other things to form the organic form, which is now more usable by human beings and by animals. But when we take those inorganic minerals directly from the soil and we take them in, whether through well water or borehole water, they don't really benefit our bodies as such. Okay. Because according to Dr. Norman Walker, PhD, DSC, he says inorganic minerals are actually lifeless. Now, on page four of his book titled, Water Can Undermine Your Health, Dr. Norman Walker, PhD, DSC, wrote, and I quote, he says, the minerals in natural or mineral water are gross and lifeless and of a kind and quality which are incompatible with the cell's needs. The cells therefore reject them. In due course, this rejection leaves a surprising accumulation of discarded minerals in the body, unquote, by Dr. Norman Walker. All right. Now, Abel Haywood, another author, wrote in an article which was published in the year 1845, and I quote, Abel Haywood said, only plants need inorganic minerals. Water, as a carrier of minerals, is fine for the plant. The plant, in turn, converts the inorganic to organic minerals. Now our bodies can assimilate them in that organic form. We have worked this process in reverse, according to Abel Haywood. We consume hard water, saturated with calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, silicon, not realizing the body is unable to assimilate these nutrients efficiently. So nature talks them in the joints, you know, as arthritis, in the intestinal walls as constipation, and along the arteries, causing them to harden, the blood vessels to harden. The kidneys and the liver roll up the mineral deposits into little stones until they get too large for the ducts. Sometimes the filters of the kidneys become so mineral clogged that kidney transplants become necessary. Calcium deposits in the heart chambers and in the valves become so cemented into place with mineral deposits that heart surgery becomes necessary. Calcium deposits in the inner ear cause deafness in some instances. Skilled surgeons can now remove these deposits and may be able to restore hearing again. Unquote from Abel Haywood. This was an article that was written as far back as 1845. Now let's talk about gallstones, you know, in the gallbladder, in the liver. The liver is somewhere here, and then the gallbladder is somewhere in the liver. Now, gallstones are now known to be formed from the constituents of bile, and they contain cholesterol, they contain bile pigments, and inorganic calcium salts. These are the things you will find in regular gallstones, gallbladder stones. Obviously then, inorganic calcium in hard water contributes to gallstones, maybe even kidney stones, as well as, you know, the hardening of our arteries, our blood vessels. Now, Dr. Norman Walker said again, and I quote, he said, again, I must call your attention to the results seen in the bottom of the kettle in which water has been boiled repeatedly, whether the water was hard or soft water. The sediment collected on the bottom of such kitchen utensils is mute evidence of the calcium and other minerals that are left at the base of the pot as residue. After the water, as steam, you know, has left the kettle. Similar mineral residues pass through the veins and arteries as a result of drinking water from faucets, from wells, springs, rivers, and so on. Heart attacks, coronary thrombosis, you know, thrombosis has to do with uh, blood clots, all right? Arthritis, rheumatism, hypertension, and many other painful afflictions can be traced to such residue remaining in the body, unquote, by Dr. Norman Walker. So, Inorganic minerals that have dissolved into particularly groundwater from wells and from boreholes can constitute a problem when we drink them and we don't find a way to purify that water before we drink or before we use it in cooking. 
Of course, towards the end of this series, I'll be talking to you about different methods and different ways to purify your water so that you can get rid of these pollutants and contaminants. Now, the number four contaminant that we're going to be talking about as far as water is concerned are microorganisms in water, microbes. Now, another major concern in drinking water are these microbes and even parasites. And these microbes and parasites that may be in water can actually cause diseases as well. So we must all ensure that our source of drinking water and the water we use in the kitchen in food preparation are unpolluted and uncontaminated. Now the simple practice of simply boiling your water before drinking it can actually solve this problem of microbes in water because they are living organisms. And when you heat your water and the water boils, they all die, okay? Now, Somebody mischievously, you know, said the other day, he said, the water that is contaminated with microbes is an aquarium of some sort. In other words, when you have these microorganisms, you know, even though they are not visible to the naked eyes, you need to put them under the microscope for you to be able to see those microbes and the parasites. So, so when you have water that has microbes and parasites in them, he said that water is an aquarium for germs. Then when you boil the water and kill all the germs, the germs are still inside, but they are now dead. He said that becomes a mortuary of some sort. <laughs> so the water that is not boiled is an aquarium. The one that is boiled is a mortuary or the graveyard, as the case may be. Now, Megan Rochter actually reported in Rita's Health in New York on Monday, November 1, 2004, that a Dutch researcher warned that even some brands of bottled water, generally considered purer than tap water, is often contaminated with bacteria and fungi as well. Okay? Now, so let's look at some examples of, you know, diseases that can come about as a result of microbes in water. They are usually called waterborne diseases. These are diseases that are caused not necessarily by the water, but by the microorganisms that have contaminated the water, polluted the water as it were. Okay? Now, diseases such as amoebiasis, you know, caused by amoeba. Many of you will remember your O-level biology. If you did O-level biology, your very first term or semester, you must learn about amoeba. <laughs> Okay, so when amoeba is inside your water and you drink it, it can cause the disease known as amoebiasis. All right? Then cholera is a very common one in this part of the world where people are both vomiting and stooling, you know, having diarrhea, and they are also having nausea and vomiting at the same time. That's cholera. Okay? Then E. coli is another very one that can happen when you drink contaminated water. Then hepatitis A can also come as a waterborne disease. Then we have salmonellosis, which is called by sal salmonina, another microbe. Then we have viral gastroenteritis, which is, you know, the inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract by a certain virus. When you hear anything, itis in medical parlance, it's talking about inflammation. So when you have hepatitis, hepa refers to the liver, itis, inflammation. So hepatitis A is the inflammation of the liver that is caused by a particular type of virus. Then when you have viral gastroenteritis, it means that a virus causing inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract, viral gastroenteritis. All right, yes, diarrhea is another disease that can happen as a result of you know, microbes in water. Then what about guinea worm disease and even typhoid fever? I remember when I used to be, uh, when I was working in the secular as an engineer, there was a particular uh, time in our company where quite a number of our staff were coming down with, with typhoid fever, typhoid fever. Everybody was getting diagnosed with typhoid fever. Some of us getting, you know, admitted in a hospital for treatment and what have you. And so management decided to look into that. Why is it that most of our staff are coming down with typhoid fever. Uh, of course, we had uh, a company clinic that our staff used, you know, for their medicals. 
So they invited the medical director of the company clinic to come and speak to us, give us a health talk on this uh, typhoid in particular and maybe some other communicable diseases. And when the medical director came, she said so many things. Of course, at that time, I was a complete ignoramus as far as healthy living was concerned. All right. I was in my, in my 30s at the time. Yeah. Was I in my 30s? There about, maybe around the age of 29, 30, there about. So, you know, one of the things I remember she said was that typhoid fever was a waterborne disease, that it can be, it can be contracted by drinking contaminated water or from food prepared by someone who is a carrier, you know, of the microbe that causes typhoid and what have you. The moment she said that, you know, inside of me, I decided, oh, is that, is that the case? I'm not going to be drinking water anymore since I don't know whether the water they will serve at the restaurant or the canteen or whatever will be pure or not. So I decided that I won't be drinking water outside of my home. The only time I drank water was at home because I was sure that my wife would boil the water and all the microbes will be dead. So from that moment, I stopped drinking water outside of my home. So when I was out at work, on the trip anywhere, the only thing I drank was soft drinks. I became addicted to soft drinks. My best soft drink then was Fanta, you know. <laughs> I could drink four, five, six bottles a day because anytime I was thirsty, I just reached out for Fanta. That's how I, I kind of deleted water <laughs> from my, my menu. And it was only soft drinks and soft drinks and soft drinks. And I overconsumed soft drinks until I believe soft drinks began to contribute to the health crisis that I suffered when I turned around the age of 36. When I became 36, my health crashed. I almost died. It got so bad, I wasn't sure I was going to see my 40th birthday. It was because of that information I got, which I didn't process correctly and I didn't respond to correctly. Of course, the medical director didn't mean that we should stop drinking water. She was only pointing out to us that this is how people contract typhoid fever. But I took it from there and made a decision, no more water, which was a very bad, a very wrong decision that I made. All I needed to do was to be sure that I carried purified water of which I was sure of the source, either in my water bottle or some other ways. We'll look at that in the future uh, in this series as we continue to discover your water and your health. But we're looking at contaminants and pollutants in water. And we have looked at today inorganic minerals dissolved in water that can cause problems in the body in the future. And we're now looking at microbes, uh, microorganisms, particularly bacteria, viruses, and uh, even parasites that can be found in water, which if we drink without taking them out, they can cause diseases when they get inside of our body. Uh, uh, we go on a very short break. And when we come back, we will start from there and look at a few other uh, water pollutants and contaminants. Don't go away. I'll be back very shortly. Welcome back. This is still Exposé with Tony Akiyemi, brought to you by TSF, the Shepherd's Flock International Church. And I'm your regular host. Tony Akiyemi is still my name. What we need, as I normally say, is not more medication, but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. 
We are looking at water pollutants and contaminants. We've looked at four so far. We're going to go to number five right now. This time, it's chemical pollutants in water. Chemicals that find their way into our water sources, either into the river or into the lake or into our wells or even our boreholes or wherever. Now, other forms of impurities constantly find their way into water due to human activities, particularly these chemicals. You know, uh, factories in particular, uh, uh, in, in environments and countries where they are not well regulated, not well controlled, you find factories dispensing factory wastes, and they find their way into our water bodies. You find farmers spraying pesticides and herbicides, and these things will be washed, you know, back into our water bodies. And then you find uh, petroleum spillage occurring regularly, particularly in petroleum producing areas, polluting the water bodies in that area. Then in this part of the world where I live, you find auto mechanics dispensing engine oil. When they are servicing your car, they drain the engine oil in your car, okay? And they are supposed to dispose of that engine oil properly. But when they drain this engine oil and other petrochemicals drain from automobiles, what we see around here, what I see is that this mechanic sometimes just pour these petrochemicals, this engine oil into the gutter. And then the rain will wash it, you know, into the stream, into the river, into the water bodies. Or sometimes when they don't pour it into the gutter, they just pour it on the, on the soil. You go to many uh, mechanic workshops and villages around here, and you will see the whole ground is black and completely, you know, all the herbs, they are dead because the, the engine oil and the petrochemicals they keep pouring on the ground has killed anything alive in that soil. You won't find any grass growing there. Everywhere is, is as if herbicides have been poured on them shining and glossy, all right? These are pollutants, chemical pollutants that we keep polluting the environment with, polluting our soil with indiscriminately, and ultimately these things will find their way into our water sources. And then they become chemical pollutants in the water that we drink or use to do our household activities. Now, Dr. Rolf Hilden, PhD, actually spoke and he said, by the way, Dr. Rolf Hilding uh, was an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health Science, as well as the Center for Water and Health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And this is what he said. I quote, he says, there is another group of chemicals called phthalates that are sometimes added to plastics to make them flexible and less brittle. Now, phthalates are environmental contaminants that can exhibit hormone-like behavior. We call them xenoestrogen. Xeno means synthetic or artificial. They have these, uh, they behave as if, uh, they, they mimic the behavior of hormones in our body, particularly estrogen and what have you. Now it says, phthalates are environmental contaminants that can exhibit hormone-like behavior by acting as endocrine disruptors in humans and animals. If you heat up plastics, you could increase the leaching of phthalates from the containers into the water and into the food, unquote, by Dr. Rob Halden. Right, so when you have impure water, that can make your blood to become impure. I mean, that is, if you are drinking impure water, the impurity in the water will get into your bloodstream and give you impure blood. And then that impure blood is going to be passing through so many glands in your body, particularly your thyroid gland. So you can see the connection between impure blood, sorry, impure water, creating impure blood, and then negatively impacting on your thyroid health. Now, the thyroid gland is a vascular gland that has ducts and vessels that convey blood, water, and lymph. I always tell people that we have two circulatory systems in our body. We have the blood circulatory system and the lymph circulatory system. Now, the circulatory system that circulates blood around the body, we have the heart as the pumping machine that is pumping boo, bah, boo, bah, to make blood so circulate around the body. Then we have lymph, which is like 
a, 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 a milky kind of fluid like that that circulates through our lymphatic system. When you sweat from your armpits, that's more or less your lymphatic system eliminating waste from your system. Okay, now, so all the blood in our body, listen to this carefully, all the blood in your body will pass through the thyroid gland here at the base of your neck in approximately about uh, 15 to 17 minutes. The volume of blood in your entire body will be passing through your thyroid gland every 15 to 17 minutes, which means that approximately four times per hour, all the volume of blood in my body will have circulated through my thyroid gland in one hour, four times in one hour, okay? Try to imagine how many times your entire blood will pass through your thyroid gland in a day. Now, that will be four times an hour. So in a day, every drop of blood in the body runs through the thyroid gland approximately 84 to 96 times per day. So all the blood in my body going through my thyroid gland 84 to 96 times per day. Now, that will amount to about 30,000 times in the year that the blood in my body is passing through and being filtered by my thyroid gland. Why does it pass through the thyroid gland? Because all the ingredients, all the building blocks, all the factors that the thyroid gland needs to make all the thyroid hormones, they are first of all deposited into the bloodstream. And as the blood carries iodine, carries selenium, carries all the things needed by my thyroid gland, and it passes through the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland will now be filtering them out and taking them out to make the hormones that it has to make. That's why the blood has to be going through the thyroid gland four times per hour. And that leads to 30,000 times in a year. So by the time a person is 40 years of age, every uh, drop of blood in that person's body has passed through that person's thyroid gland over 1 million times by the age of 40. Now, the implication is that if our blood is carrying a lot of impurities from the water we drink, the food we eat, and what have you, some of these impurities are now going to be trapped in the thyroid because the thyroid is then serving as a filter, removing selenium, removing iodine, removing all the building blocks it needs. But when there is impurity, it picks up those impurities again, and those impurities get trapped in the thyroid, in the thyroid gland. Now, this may cause the thyroid gland to enlarge. That condition is known as exothalmic goiter. Another word for that is toxic goiter because it's actually as a result of a toxic buildup that the thyroid picked from the blood passing through it four times per hour. And this results in an overly active thyroid that results in nervousness, you know, weight loss, inexplicable weight loss, and protruding eyeballs for some people. So when you see somebody who never used to be like that, and suddenly you see the two eyeballs as if they are trying to bulge out, they are protruding, that person has a thyroid problem. The thyroid is hyperactive. And it could be as a result of toxic thyroid gland because of the many impurities it has picked up from the blood. And how did those impurities get into the blood? Principally from what that person eats and drinks, particularly from water. All right. Now, there's another interesting twist to this. Even your gene expression, how my genes express, how your genes express, has something to do with the quality of the water that we drink, as well as, of course, the quality of our diet. And a third dimension is the quality of our beliefs, what we believe in our minds. So the quality of your diet, the quality of your water, the quality of the air that you breathe, and the quality of the thoughts and beliefs in your mind, all these will combine to determine how your genes express. Now, there's something about genes. Many people think that gene expression is already cast in concrete. If you carry a particular gene, that gene will express. No, gene expression is usually predicated on certain factors. Now, all the genes in our body, geneticists tell us that 75% of them are non-automatic genes. 
only 25% are automatic genes, okay? So what that means is this. If you have 100 different types of genes, I'm just using a hypothetical figure, 100 different types of genes in your body, 75 of those 100 are not going to express automatically simply because you have them in your body. But they only express when they are triggered, when they are switched on. If you don't trigger them, they remain dormant for life. 75% of the genes in our body are like that. Only 25% are automatic genes. In other words, those genes, they don't depend on what you do or don't do. They are just there, they just express. The genes that code for your skin color, for example, the hair type that you have, the color of your eyes, and certain features and characteristics that everybody can see in your uniqueness, okay? Those genes are automatic genes. They just express. You don't need to do anything to make them express. But there are other genes in our body that are not automatic, that until something triggers them. And some of the things that would trigger the expression of some disease-causing genes is the amount of toxins in the body, or how oxygen-deprived the body is, or how acidic the body is, or how polluted the body is, or the belief system and the thoughts in the mind of a person. So this is where your diet, your water, your air, the air that you breathe, your thoughts, and your belief system play a role as triggers to trigger gene expression. Now, so how does your thought and your belief become a trigger? The reason is that what you think and what you believe can also make your body to start releasing certain chemicals in your body. And those chemicals can then trigger something. For example, uh, I'm looking for the best example to use now. For example, if, 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 if you are, there, are, there are certain thoughts you'll be thinking in your mind and suddenly you begin to develop goose pimples. A reaction is happening. There are certain things that you will think of and then you become afraid because of that. And then your body will start secre secreting adrenaline and your body will start secreting cortisol, chemicals from your glands, from your adrenal gland, okay? just because of a thought or a belief in your mind. If you hear a knock on the door, co -co -co -co, and you simply believe that, oh, those are armed robbers outside there knocking the door, and they are carrying guns, or maybe they are assassins, they have come for me, they want to come and kill me. That thought and that belief, if you believe it, suddenly you will see that your body will start secreting chemicals, adrenaline, and cortisol. Why? Because of what you believe. It doesn't matter whether that thing is true or not, whether it is real or not. The fact that the thought came, you accepted the thought, you believed the thought, it begins to inf uh, influence a number of chemical reactions in your body. Okay? And then if you, another person hears that same knock on the door and believes that, oh, the courier man is here. He has come to deliver a parcel to me from my husband or from my wife or from my boyfriend, you know, that thought and that belief elicits happiness and joy. And you see the person will start releasing another set of chemicals, endorphins, which are, you know, feel-good chemicals. And those endorphins will trigger some beautiful things in your system. So the thought in the mind is very powerful. That's why the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the quality of your diet is number one. That determines the nutrients that come into your body and maybe the contaminants and pollutants that come along with that diet. The water you drink, water in itself is very good to perform many good functions in your body towards your health. But then if that water carries contaminants, microbes, inorganic minerals, and chemical pollutants, that is going to cause problems when it comes to your body. The quality of the air that you breathe and the quality of your thoughts and beliefs, all of these will go to determine how your genes are expressed. So we need to be sure that the water coming into our body, they are clean, they are pure, 
they are unpolluted, they are uncontaminated, and they possess certain features and characteristics which we're going to be looking at. And then I'll be sharing with you in subsequent editions how to purify your water, the different methods, the pros and cons uh, of each and every one of them. Thank you for staying with me again today on Exposé with Tony Akiemi. Our axiom is what we need is not more medication, but more education. For the best prescription is knowledge. I'll come your way again, God willing, next week, same time, same platform, on Exposé with Tony Akiemi, 8 p.m. West African time. God bless you, love you, have a terrific week. Bye.